I watch the passage of the morning cars with the same feeling that I do the rising of the sun, which is hardly more regular. The train of clouds stretching far behind and rising higher and higher, going to heaven while the cars are going to Boston, conceals the sun for a minute and casts my distant field into the shade, a celestial train beside which the petty train of cars which hugs the earth is but the barb of the spear. The stabler of the iron horse was up early this winter morning by the light of the stars amid the mountains to fodder and harness his steed. Fire, too, was awakened thus early to put the vital heat in him and get him off. If the enterprise were as innocent as it is early, if the snow lies deep, they strap on his snowshoes and, with a giant plow, plow a furrow from the mountains to the seaboard, in which the cars, like a following drill barrow, sprinkle all the restless men and floating merchandise in the country for seed. All day the fire steed flies over the country, stopping only that his master may rest, and I am awakened by his tramp and defiant snort at midnight, when in some remote glen in the woods he fronts the elements encased in ice and snow, and he will reach his stall only with the morning star to start once more on his travels without rest or slumber. Or perchance at evening, I hear him in his stable blowing off the superfluous energy of the day, that he may calm his nerves and cool his liver and brain for a few hours of iron slumber. If the enterprise were as heroic and commanding as it is protracted and unwearied. Far through unfrequented woods on the confines of town, where once only the hunter penetrated by day, and the darkest night dart these bright saloons without the knowledge of their inhabitants. This morning, stopping at some brilliant station house in town or city, where a social crowd is gathered, the next in the dismal swamp, scaring the owl and fox. The startings and arrivals of the cars are now the epochs in the village day. They go and come with such regularity and precision, and their whistle can be heard so far that the farmers set their clocks by them, and thus one well-conducted institution regulates a whole country. Have not men improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Do they not talk and think faster in the depot than they did in the stage office? There is something electrifying in the atmosphere of the former place. I have been astonished at the miracles it has wrought that some of my neighbors, who I should have prophesied, once for all, would never get to Boston by so prompt a conveyance, are on hand when the bell rings. To do things railroad fashion is now the byword, and it is worth the while to be warned so often and so sincerely by any power to get off its track. There is no stopping to read the riot act, no firing over the heads of the mob, in this case. We have constructed a fate, an atropos, that never turns aside. Let that be the name of your engine. Men are advised that at a certain hour and minute these bolts will be shot toward particular points of the compass. Yet it interferes with no man's business, and the children go to school on the other track. We live the steadier for it. We are all educated thus to be sons of Tell. The air is full of invisible bolts. Every path but your own is the path of fate. Keep on your own track, then. What recommends commerce to me is its enterprise and bravery. It does not clasp its hands and pray to Jupiter. I see these men every day go about their business with more or less courage and content, doing more even than they suspect, and perchance better employed than they could have consciously devised. I am less affected by their heroism, who stood up for half an hour in the front line at Buena Vista, than by the steady and cheerful valor of the men who inhabit the snowplow for their winter quarters, who have not merely the three o'clock in the morning courage, which Bonaparte thought was the rarest, but whose courage does not go to rest so early, who go to sleep only when the storm sleeps or the sinews and their iron steed are frozen. 
On this morning of the great snow, perchance, which is still raging and chilling men's blood, I bear the muffled tone of their engine bell from out the fog bank of their chilled breath which announces that the cars are coming. Without long delay, notwithstanding the veto of a New England northeast snowstorm, and I behold the plowmen covered with snow and rime, their heads peering above the mold board which is turning down other than daisies and the nests of field mice, like boulders of the Sierra Nevada that occupy an outside place in the universe. Commerce is unexpectedly confident and serene, alert, adventurous, and unwearied. It is very natural in its methods with all, for more so than many fantastic enterprises and sentimental experiments, and hence its singular success. I am refreshed and expanded when the freight train rattles past me, and I smell the stores which go dispensing their odors all the way from Long Wharf to Lake Champlain, reminding me of foreign parts of coral reefs and Indian oceans and tropical climes and the extent of the globe. I feel more like a citizen of the world at the sight of the palm leaf which will cover so many flax in New England heads the next summer, the manila hemp and coconut husks, the old junk gunny bags, scrap iron, and rusty nails. This carload of torn sails is more legible and interesting now than if they should be wrought into paper and printed books. Who can write so graphically the history of the storms they have weathered as these rents have done? They are proof sheets which need no correction. Here goes slumber from the main woods which did not go out to sea in the last freshest risen four dollars on the thousand because of what did go out and was split up pine spruce cedar first second third and fourth qualities so lately all of one quality to wave over the bear and moose and caribou next rolls thomaston lime a prime lot which will get far among the hills before it gets slacked these rags and bales of all hues and qualities, the lowest condition to which cotton and linen descend, the final result of dress, of patterns which are now no longer cried up, unless it be in Milwaukee, as those splendid articles, English, French, or American prints, ginghams, muslins, etc., gathered from all quarters both of fashion and poverty going to become paper of one color or a few shades only, on which, forsooth, will be written tales of real life, high and low, and founded on fact. This closed car smells of salt fish, the strong New England and commercial scent, reminding me of the great banks and the fisheries. Who has not seen a salt fish thoroughly cured for this world, so that nothing can spoil it, and putting the perseverance of the saints to the blush, with which you may sweep or pave the streets and split your kindlings, and the teamster shelter himself and his ladding against sun, wind, and rain behind it, and the trader, as a Concord trader once did, hang it up by his door for a sign when he commences business until at last his oldest customer cannot tell surely whether it be animal vegetable or mineral, and yet it shall be as pure as a snowflake, and if it be put into a pot and boiled, will come out an excellent dun fish for a Saturday's dinner. Next, Spanish hides, with the tails still preserving their twist and the angle of elevation they had when the oxen that wore them were careening over the pampas of the Spanish main, a type of all obstinacy, and evincing how almost hopeless and incurable are all constitutional vices. I confess that, practically speaking, when I have learned a man's real disposition, I have no hopes of changing it for the better or worse in this state of existence. As the Orientals say, a cur's tail may be warmed and pressed and bound round with ligatures, 
and after a twelve years' labor bestowed upon it, still it will retain its natural form. The only effectual cure for such inveteracies as these tales exhibit is to make glue of them, which I believe is what is usually done with them, and then they will stay put and stick. Here is a hogshead of molasses or of brandy directed to John Smith, Cuttingsville, Vermont, some trader among the Green Mountains, who imports for the farmers near his clearing, and now perchance stands over his bulkhead and thinks of the last arrivals on the coast, how they may affect the price for him, telling his customers this moment, as he has told them twenty times before this morning, that he expects some by the next train of prime quality. It is advertised in the Cuttingsville Times. While these things go up, other things come down. Warned by the whizzing sound, I look up from my book and see some tall pine, hewn on far northern hills, which has winged its way over the Green Mountains and the Connecticut, shot like an arrow through the township with, within ten minutes, and scarce another eye beholds it going to be the mast of some great emerald. And hark, here comes the cattle train bearing the cattle of a thousand hills, sheep, cots, stables, and cow yards in the air, drovers with their sticks, and shepherd boys in the midst of their flocks, all but the mountain pastures, whirled along like leaves blown from the mountains by the September gales. The air is filled with the bleeding of calves and sheep, and the hustling of oxen, as if a pastoral valley were going by. When the old bellwether at the head rattles his bell, the mountains do indeed skip like rams, and the little hills like lambs. A carload of drovers, too, in the midst, on a level with their drovers now, their vocation gone, but still clinging to their useless sticks as their badge of office. But their dogs, where are they? It is a stampede to them. They are quite thrown out. They have lost the scent. Methinks I hear them barking behind the Peterborough hills, or panting up the western slope of the Green Mountains. They will not be in at the death. Their vocation, too, is gone. Their fidelity and Sega City were below par now. They will slink back to their kennels in disgrace, or perchance run wild and strike a league with the wolf and the fox. So is your pastoral life whirled past and away. But the bell rings, and I must get off the track and let the cars go by. What's the railroad to me? I never go to see. Where it ends, it fills a few hollows, and makes banks for the swallows. It sets the sand a-blowing, and the blackberries a-growing. But I cross it like a cart path in the woods. I will not have my eyes put out and my ears spoiled by its smoke and steam and hissing. Now that the cars are gone by, and all the restless world with them, and the fishes in the pond no longer feel their rumbling, I am more alone than ever. For the rest of the long afternoon, perhaps, my meditations are interrupted only by the faint rattle of a carriage or team along the distant highway. Sometimes, on Sundays, I heard the bells, the Lincoln, Acton, Bedford, and Concord bell, when the wind was favorable, a faint, sweet, and, as it were, natural melody, worth importing into the wilderness. At a sufficient distance over the woods, the sound acquires a certain vibratory hum, as if the pine needles in the horizon were the strings of a harp which it swept. All sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, a vibration of the universal lyre. Just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it. There came to me in this case a melody which the air had strained, 
and which had conversed with every leaf and needle of the wood, that portion of the sound which the elements had taken up and modulated and echoed from veil to veil. The echo is, to some extent, an original sound, and therein is the magic and charm of it. It is not merely a repetition of what was worth repeating in the bell, but partly the voice of the wood, the same trivial words and notes sung by a wood nymph. At evening, the distant lowing of some cow in the horizon beyond the woods sounded sweet and melodious, and at first I would mistake it for the voices of certain minstrels by whom I was sometimes serenaded who might be straying over hill and dale, but soon I was not unpleasantly disappointed when it was prolonged into the cheap and natural music of the cow. I do not mean to be satirical, but to express my appreciation of those youths singing, when I state that I perceived clearly that it was akin to the music of the cow, and they were at length one articulation of nature. Regularly at half past seven in one part of the summer, after the evening train had gone by, the whippoorwills chanted their vespers for half an hour, sitting on a stump by my door, or upon the ridge pole of the house. They would begin to sing almost with as much precision as a clock, within five minutes of a particular time, referred to the setting of the sun every evening. What a rare opportunity to become acquainted with their habits. Sometimes I heard four or five at once in different parts of the wood. By accident one, a bar behind another, so near me that I distinguished not only the cluck after each note, but often that singular buzzing sound like a fly in a spider's web, only proportionately louder. Sometimes one would circle round and round me in the woods a few feet distant, as if tethered by a string, when probably I was near its eggs. They sang at intervals throughout the night, and were again as musical as ever just before and about dawn. When other birds are still, the screech owls take up the strain, like morning women their ancient ululu. Their dismal scream is truly Ben Johnsonian. Wise midnight hags. It is no honest and blunt to wit to who of the poets, but, without jesting, a most solemn graveyard ditty. The mutual consolations of suicide lovers remembering the pangs and the delights of supernal love in the infernal groves. Yet I love to hear their wailing, their doleful responses, trilled along the woodside, reminding me sometimes of music and singing birds, as if it were the dark and tearful side of music, the regrets and sighs that would fain be sung. They are the spirits, the low spirits and melancholy forebodings of fallen souls that once in human shape night walked the earth and did the deeds of darkness, now expiating their sins with their wailing hymns on their notes in the scenery of their transgressions. They give me a sense of the variety and capacity of that nature which is our common dwelling. Oh, that I never had been born sighs one on the side of the pond, and circles with the restlessness of despair to some new perch on the gray oaks. Then that I never had been born, echoes another on the farther side with tremulous sincerity, and born comes faintly from far in the Lincoln woods. I was also serenaded by a hooting owl, Near at hand, you could fancy it the most melancholy sound in nature, as if she meant by this to stereotype and make permanent in her choir the dying moans of a human being, some poor weak relic of mortality who has left hope behind, and howls like an animal, yet with human sobs, on entering the dark valley 
made more awful by a certain gurgling melodiousness. I find myself beginning with the letters GL when I try to imitate it, expressive of a mind which has reached the gelatinous, mildewy stage in the mortification of all healthy and courageous thought. It reminds me of ghouls and idiots and insane howlings, but now one answers from far woods in a strain made really melodious by distance. Hoo hoo hoo, hoo or hoo. And indeed, for the most part, it suggested only pleasing associations, whether heard by day or night, summer or winter. I rejoice that there are owls. Let them do the idiotic and maniacal hooting for men. It is a sound admirably suited to swamps and twilight woods, which no day illustrates, suggesting a vast and undeveloped nature which men have not recognized. They represent the stark twilight and unsatisfied thoughts which all have. All day the sun has shone on the surface of some savage swamp, where the single spruce stands hung with eusnea lichens, and small hawks circulate above, and the chickadee lisps amid the evergreens, and the partridge and rabbit skulk beneath. But now a more dismal and fitting day dawns, and a different race of creatures awakens to express the meaning of nature there. Late in the evening, I heard the distant rumbling of wagons over bridges, a sound heard rather than almost any other at night, the baying of dogs, and sometimes again the lowing of some disconsolate cow in a distant barnyard. In the meanwhile, all the shore rang with the trump of bullfrogs, the sturdy spirits of ancient wine-bibbers and wassailers, still unrepentant, trying to sing a catch in their Stygian lake. If the Walden nymphs will pardon the comparison, for though there are almost no weeds, there are frogs here. Who would fain keep up the hilarious rules of their old festal tables? Though their voices have waxed hoarse and solemnly grave, mocking at mirth, and the wine has lost its flavor, and become only liquor to distend their paunches, and sweet intoxication never comes to drown the memory of the past, but mere saturation and waterloggedness and dissension. The most aldermanic, with his chin upon a heart leaf, which serves for a napkin to his drooping chaps, under the northern shore quaffs a deep draught of the once scorned water, and passes round the cup with the ejaculation, trunk, 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 and straightway comes over the water with some distant cove, the same password repeated, where the next in seniority and girth has gulped down to his mark, and when this observance has made the circuit of the shores, then ejaculates the master of ceremonies, with satisfaction, trunk, and each in the, his turn repeats the same down to the least distended, leakiest, and flabbiest paunched, that there be no mistake, and then the howl goes round again and again until the sun disperses the morning mist, and only the patriarch is not under the pond, but vainly bellowing trunk from time to time, and pausing for a reply. I am not sure that I have ever heard the sound of cock crowing from my clearing, and I thought that it might be worth the while to keep a cockerel for his music merely, as a singing bird, the note of this once wild Indian pheasant is certainly the most remarkable of any birds, and if they could be naturalized without being domesticated, it would soon become the most famous sound in our woods, surpassing the clangor of the goose and the hooting of the owl, and then imagine the cackling of the hens to fill the pauses when their lord's clarions rested. No wonder that man added this bird to his tame stock, 
to say nothing of the eggs and drumsticks. To walk in a winter morning in a wood where these birds abounded, their native woods, and hear the wild cockerels crow on the trees, clear and shrill for miles over the resounding earth, drowning the feebler notes of other birds. Think of it. It would put nations on the alert. Who would not be early to rise, and rise earlier and earlier every successive day of his life, till he became unspeakably healthy, wealthy, and wise? This foreign bird's note is celebrated by the poets of all countries along with the notes of their native songsters. All climates agree with brave Chauticleer. He is more indigenous even than the natives. His health is ever good, his lungs are sound, his spirits never flag. Even the sailor on the Atlantic and Pacific is awakened by his voice but its shrill sound never roused me from my slumbers. I kept neither dog, cat, cow, pig, nor hens. So that you would have said there was a deficiency of domestic sounds. Neither the churn, nor the spinning wheel, nor even the singing of the kettle, nor the hissing of the urn, nor children crying to comfort one. An old-fashioned man would have lost his senses or died of ennui before this. Not even rats in the wall, for they were starved out, or rather were never baited in. Only squirrels on the roof and under the floor, a whip poor will on the ridge pole, a blue jay screaming beneath the window, a hare or woodchuck under the house, a screech owl or a cat owl behind it, a flock of wild geese or a laughing loon on the pond, and a fox to bark in the night. Not even a lark or an oriole, those mild plantation birds, ever visited my clearing.